Very good morning. It's good to see everybody out, even with a little bit of rain. I appreciate that, that Aaron led those songs because we need to look up for our salvation. As we begin this morning, we're in Paul's second missionary journey. As we sort of turn the, the Bible there in, 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 in Acts, uh, we're in chapter 17. And he's there with Silas. As you recall, in the, sort of in the uh, first missionary journey, he was much more with uh, Barnabas. And we find him first in, in Thessalonica. And everything's going fine. He does the this, this standard, uh, his, his standard modus operandi. He goes, where, where does he go first? He goes over to the uh, synagogue and he preaches. And things go pretty well. As a matter of fact, he preaches three times. But does it last? No, it doesn't. Unfortunately, it does not last. They chase him out. Recall there's the issue there with, at the house of Jason, and then they sort of scoot him out by night. And they send him to where? They send him over to Berea. Things go well there pretty well because why? Bereans were a bit more noble-minded. A bit more noble-minded. And they receive with, with, with anxiousness. They were, they were so happy to, to, to uh, check out the message that Paul delivers. But the, Thessalonica, uh, the, the Jews from Thessalonica had stolen a, a page from the uh, playbook from those uh, over in, in Antioch, Pisidia, and, and Iconium. And remember, they come down and they uh, sort of stir the program up and they, they, they get Paul sort of squashed again. And so they say, we need, to, we need to get him out of here. So they take Paul kind of down by the sea and then... And I kind of envision it uh, uh, that they, they, they kind of have him in the car, just the, the, the people, and they, and, they, and they stop by Athens. Now, I don't know if he's supposed to go to Athens or not supposed to go to Athens. It just said that they stop in Athens. And if you would, just turn to Acts 17, 16. I, I find this just sort of a, as an aside, Acts 16, uh, uh, 17, 16, Acts 17, 16, kind of interesting, the way it reads. That's why I was sort of talking about him being dropped off, you know, uh, by a car and, and his colleagues. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, does that strike you sort of interest, in an interesting or odd manner? It did me because you think about Paul. Do you see him as a guy waiting around? No, I don't see him as a waiting around kind of guy. And we see the rest of what transpires the next few verses, and I would like to talk about that. We have Paul in Athens. Let's talk about Athens. Well, Athens and the Athenians, uh, it's, not, it's not a city that just has history. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a story that's in antiquity. That's an old, old city, old, old uh, group of people, civilization. Maybe as far back as the fourth century BC, very old. They had wars, just like every other group of people. Even with the Persians. Remember the Persians? Medo-Persian Empire? They even had battles with a guy named Darius I. Azurius, which is named uh, uh, Xerxes. And we see those two kings particularly mentioned in the Old Testament. Remember in Ezra and Esther. Something that I didn't know as, as we had read through our lesson is, is this city was was smaller than what its zenith was way back four or five hundred years ago from the time that Paul would visit. It was around two, uh, 20,000 to 25,000 people. It had its politics, just like every other group. It had its monarchies, and even some of the democracy ideas would start there. It had fine art, Greek literature, the theater, all the fineries of life. They even had education, very educated people. A lot of people were sort of if you will, envious of that being the center of education. But what kind of education was, was, was there? And we know this. It was more of on a, more on a philosophy perspective. I mean, if you've been in school for any time, you've heard Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. That didn't come from Sweden. That came from this area. This came from the Greek area. And we come down to where Paul is talking to the people there, and he runs into the Epicureans and the Stoics. So it just carries forward with this concept of philosophy. And I want us to make a point here. 
they wanted those around Athens at this time, they wanted to hear something new from those around them to tickle their ears. Let's go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 and 3. This is something we know about. This is something we've heard about. You see, they wanted to hear, let's, let's see if we can have, you know, Brother John tell us something. Let's go see if we can have somebody else come and tell us something that will tickle our ears. We want to be able to say, I have somebody that said something you haven't heard. So 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. You see what's happening here in Athens? They don't want to learn something to learn something. They want to be able to say, I heard it first, or I can present to you somebody that told them something new. They wanted to hear something new from those around them to tickle their ears. But have no fear, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the beauty of this is Paul's there. And remember, Paul's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's a Jew of Jews. If you want to, once again, if you want to know what a Jew is, you look at Paul. And he brings in this, at least this background of Judaism. Uh, now, he was not born in Jerusalem. He was born in Tarsus, uh, there in Cilicia. But he had been there, and he had been a Jew all his life. He had studied it under Gamaliel. And I find it very interesting that when we look at Jerusalem, it's on par with Athens. It's on par. You think about uh, Genesis 14 when Abraham was coming back from the Nine Kings War, and he had to rescue his, his nephew Lot. Who did he run into? Melchizedek, and he was the high priest of Salem, which is the forerunner of Jerusalem. Jerusalem and, and, and Judah... Judaism, as we know, has been around a long time. And ladies and gentlemen, we know, we know there was many, many wars in the history of, uh, of Judaism in Jerusalem. We know that. We, can, we could name them on and on and on. I'd be up here for half an hour because that's what happened. That happened everywhere. Well, did they have uh, the same kind of politics? Well, similar. They had at least a history of politics. There in Jerusalem. I guess you could sort of say overarching is God, which is good. But remember, they moved through a sort of a patriarchal stage. And then they also moved from there. They, 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 they had judges. And then they demanded a king. Right? So that's, there's nothing really much different there either. What about their education? What about their education? Can we name people that have educated the, the, the nation of uh, Israel or uh, the Jews? Yes, we can do that. That's easy. I already mentioned one, Abraham. And we can go right on down the line. There's, there's tons of people that we could mention. But I mean, Abraham, who do you think they would also identify with? Moses? Yeah, they would identify with Moses. What about Elijah? They may not want to hear, but they heard from people like Jeremiah or, you know, Isaiah. <laughs> but I want to bring out something a little bit different. Where the Athenians wanted to hear something new, to tickle their ears from those around them. The Jews needed to hear something new. You see, they were looking back. Remember uh, the last uh, couple, two or three weeks ago, uh, Brian was bringing up the kind of the the balance there. Do do we do we do the works of, of of Moses and the law, or do we just simply believe in Jesus? It doesn't mean if you just believe, you do nothing but believe. But they struggled with that, and they said, "Well, I'm not really sure we need Jesus. I'm not sure that we need Jesus. I think I'm going to look back and depend on Moses." And I'm not only going to depend on Moses, but the law. That's what I'm going to do. You see, they needed to hear something new because they were looking back and they had a false sense of security. A false sense of security. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. And we're going to see 
that same concept presented. First Thessalonians 5, verse 3. You see, they needed to hear something new. Why? Because they were looking back and they had a false sense of security. Let's see what it says here. First Thessalonians 5, verse 3. While they were saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. You see what's happening here? They're depending on something, not directly in this context, but what they're depending on is something that as, as time has now passed and Christ has now come, will not hold water. It can't. Just like Athens was a city that had so much, such rich history and art and politics and things like that, it was a spiritually dead city. And just like Jerusalem probably was really ahead of Athens from the perspective at least they were God believers, God fearers, if you will, they were Jews, they were looking back. And that city was spiritually dead. That's unbelievable. But Paul didn't come to Athens as a Jew. Paul came to Athens as a Christian. I don't know exactly what he said. We don't, we don't know. But I do know this. He was not looking around. He was not looking back. But most certainly, he was looking up. We have to start this looking up process by kindly visiting a few verses in the Bible. You see, God loved us when we simply weren't. He loved us when we weren't. Ephesians 1 and 5 talks about God had purposed Christ to take care of our sins before the existence of the earth. He was ready. God is a prepared God. God sent his son to fill it. It wasn't theory. It wasn't an academic study for God. He was ready. And he sent his son to fulfill what he had promised, what he had had in his mind. We see that in John 3, 17. And Christ would not show up on this earth just poof as a king with a scepter and he could say, you're going to do what I say or you're going to die. No, he was born just like we were of a virgin. And his first pillow would probably be the straw of a manger, not of a king. We see that in Luke 2, 6. And though he was born, he was a human, yet fully divine. He was the only 200% person on the face of the planet. We talk about I'm 100% this, that, or another. He was 200%, completely human, completely divine. Philippians 2, 6 through 7. And he lived here on this earth, just like we did. And he was tempted just like we were. You see, God did not protect his son. He didn't say, uh, Jesus, don't go over there. You're going to be tempted. Don't do that. Never did that. Never did that. So that we'd have a good, perfect, pure example. Hebrews 4. 15, yet he did not sin. No guile was found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, 22. And all this would begin to accumulate or, uh, to, to, to a trial because he was innocently tried and yet shamefully convicted by Pilate, remember, in John 19, 6. And the finality of it would be, he would be lifted up and crucified. See that in John, over in John 12 in the crucifixion, several places, Matthew 27, 20, uh, excuse me, Matthew 27, 35. He would be lifted up. Where do we need to look for our salvation? Around us? Behind us? No, we need to look above us. Because Christ was lifted up on a cross for you and me and our sins. 
As we close, let's look at 1 Corinthians, if you would. 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, we're going to begin in verse 23. Familiar, familiar words. First Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When we begin to look at the, the Lord's Supper, the bread that would represent that body, the blood that was spilled, represented by the, the fruit of the vine, let us remember, we need to look up at our Savior on that cross where he died for us.